Let's go to Daniel chapter three together, please. Daniel chapter three. Well, I've had such an encouraging day with you all. Thank you so much for the invitation again to be with you this week. Um, I knew more of you, or at least secondhand knew more of you than I had first realized, and it's such a blessing. And also a blessing to make new acquaintances and relationships. Dan, I appreciate so much the kind words about your mother especially. She was just one of the dearest people in the world. Your aunt scared me to death. But your mother was just a sweet, sweet individual. So this morning, Dan, so accurately summarized my sermons. I genuinely appreciate you got at the heart both times of what I was trying to say. I really appreciate that. Sometimes, especially in closing prayers, people try to summarize and I'm just like, that's not quite what I meant. But that's exactly what I meant. And I really appreciate that. This morning, we're going to talk about the redemptive nature of God. And I'd like to consider how does God relate to our trials? This morning, the class was really just more about the very essence of God, who he is both in time and in eternity. The sermon this morning was about God's redemptive work and reconcili re reconciliation that he has worked through Jesus Christ and continues to reach out to us. But this evening, I would like to ask, how does God relate to his people who go through trials? Of course, Christians go through trials and hardships. How does our self-giving, loving God, how does our God of all reconciliation relate to us during these trials? And so tonight, I'm going to tell you one of my kids' favorite stories, and it's definitely one of mine as well, the story of the burning, fiery furnace in Daniel chapter 3. What I'm going to do is work through this chapter, and then after we're done, try to make a couple of observations about how it can relate to our trials. So let's just listen to this great story. Daniel chapter three, verse one. Daniel three, verse one. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits in breadth, six cubits. He set it up on the plains of Dora in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, all the officials of the province to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded. O peoples, nations, languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as the people heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, all peoples, nations, languages fell down, worshiped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Well, let's notice the context for Daniel chapter 3. In Daniel chapter 2, the king had had this great vision of this great statue that only Daniel was able to interpret. The statue that had the feet and the hands made of different materials. Essentially, what that whole image is about is that every kingdom of man is going to fall, but the humble kingdom of God is going to reign eternally. King Nebuchadnezzar didn't quite get the point. Rather than humbling himself before God and repenting of his sins and seeking the Lord's face, he takes that vision and says, Great, let me build myself a great golden image. You kind of missed the point, Nebuchadnezzar. And so after constructing for his own self this great golden statue, he calls all peoples of all tribes and all languages to come together and worship his image and calls every instrument that they knew of Wikipedia a trigon, because I'm sure most of us have no idea what that is. He calls all instruments to come together and tells them, fall down and worship before this. And whoever does not worship before this shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward 
and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O King. But if not, be it known to you, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now the plot thickens. King Nebuchadnezzar in his hubris erects a great golden image and demands that all people bow before it. Then some provocateurs come along and say, well, King, you know there are these Jews who refuse to bow. King Nebuchadnezzar, much like King Ahasuerus in the book of Esther, is a king who can only focus on the one thing he does not have. And so, knowing there are just a few that are not falling before his idol, he says, bring them to me, and threatens their life. If you do not fall before my image, you will be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. And they respond, if this be so, our God whom we serve will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to us, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar said, okay, you make a rational point, you're free to go. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than the usual heat. He ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and other garments, and were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent, and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound in the fire? They answered and said to them, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Plot twist. The king expects, here are these stubborn, rebellious Jews who refuse to worship before my image. This burning, fiery furnace will teach everyone to fall before me in fear. And yet instead, King Nebuchadnezzar looks in and sees four men walking in the fire. Now, very briefly, who is this fourth figure? Many say it's an angel, a host of heaven. Others say it's a pre-incarnate Jesus. 
whichever way you take it, the point stands. God is with these men. God is not abandoning his people. God is with them. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. What an encouraging narrative this is. And I think this narrative is a favorite of children for the same reason it should be a favorite of adults as well. It is a reminder to us that God is with us. God is with us. Two words of encouragement that I would like to offer based upon this story. The first is this. God walks with us. God walks with us. Keep your finger in Daniel 3, but go back to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Now, as you think through your chronology of the Old Testament, Isaiah comes before Daniel. Isaiah lives during the time of multiple kings, but up through the time of Hezekiah. And lives about 100, 150 years, prophesies about 100, 150 years before Daniel. Daniel, we know for a fact, knows of the writings of Jeremiah because he quotes Jeremiah in Daniel 9. And I am convinced that Daniel knew of the writings of Isaiah because listen to what this greatest a prophet said. Isaiah 43, verse 1. Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Though the rivers, and excuse me, let me me read this. It's too important. Verse two, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am Yahweh, your God the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you up. The words that Isaiah speaks, the words that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego live out are the words I would like to extend to you this evening. God is with us through our trials. Period. In the discussion. God is with us. Our trials are not too great for God. Our trials are not too foreign for God. Because the king has left the castle and entered into the sickness. We on this side of the cross know how much more fully these words resonate. God is continually with us. 
But then it's easy for me to come up and tell you, oh, God is with you. Have faith, God is with you. But then we have to deal with the realism of life is tough. In our own forms and in our own fashion, we experience trials and tribulations that feel like the fire that will overwhelm us, that feel like the waters that will overtake us. Why does God put us through these? Much as God tells Job, I don't claim to have a clear answer here. But a brother from Manslick sent me this about a year and a half ago, and I'd like to share it with you. I asked God, why are you taking me through troubled water? He replied, because your enemies can't swim. Faithlessness, impatience, cannot swim. The fleeting passions of this world cannot swim. Satan cannot swim. God is with us through the trials. Let's go back to the greatest of historical events in the Old Testament and think through the Exodus. In Isaiah chapter 51, verses 9 to 11, and in Psalm 74, verses 13 to 15, the Pharaoh is described as a sea monster. The irony of that is when you go into Exodus 14 and read about the Red Sea, God drowned the host of Egypt in the water. The sea serpent that should have been able to live in the sea is drowned in his own water. And yet, who is taking the safety on the other side? The people of God. God never, let me repeat this, God never zaps his people out of trial and temptation. God never zaps his people out of affliction and sorrow. God never zaps his people out of suffering. But God, in his unseen way, is always with his people. Even in his absence. God is not absent. But God is always present. The fires, they feel like they'll overtake us. But our enemies cannot endure them. The waters feel like they will overwhelm us. But God is greater than the waters. God is with us. That was my word of encouragement. Now it's time for a word of exhortation. I think as Christians, we need to take the story of Daniel 3 and live it in our prayers. We need to live it in our prayers. What I mean by that, go back to Daniel chapter three and notice with me verse 17. Daniel three, verse 17. Daniel three seventeen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. If I could offer my word of exhortation simply, it's this. Let us pray for redemption over rescue. Let us pray for redemption over rescue. What I mean by that is this. When we pray for redemption, we pray for God to be with us through our trials. When we pray for rescue, we pray for God to take us from our trials. Let me repeat this again, because I think this is so important. When we pray for redemption, we pray for God to be with us through our trials. When we pray for rescue, we pray for God to take us from our trials. Now, we as followers of the scripture must pray by the promises of the scripture. Never once, never once does God promise to take us from every trial. Never once does God promise to take us from any trial. But hundreds of times in the scripture, God promises to be with us 
through the trial. Let's apply this. We found out a week and a half ago that my mom has breast cancer. No, no details at all about her prognosis. She goes on Monday tomorrow for her first follow-up with a specialist. What should I be praying right now? Realistically, what should I be praying? I know that I want to pray, God, take the cancer away. And I think that's a very good thing to pray for. Because God does not want any of his children to suffer. God does not delight in the suffering of any of his children. But you know what I'm trying to pray? Father, no matter, no matter what the prognosis may be, be with us through the trial. How many Christians have lost their faith in God because God did not deliver them from a trial? So many I know. God never once promises to take us from us. He promises to be with us through the trial. And at this point, we have to talk about Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that God calls us all things to work together for good for those who are called for you as well. And we say it again. We know that God causes all things to work together for good for those that are called according to his purpose. I've heard that passage used in a way that's bothered me for years. But it wasn't until the beginning of the pandemic I was able to really put my finger on what was bothering me about this. I've noticed that a lot of times whenever we encounter bad news in our Christian family, Romans 8, 28 is just a quick word that don't worry, God's going to cause it to be good. God's going to cause it to be good. Thank you, Missy. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I've had this question. If God causes all things to be good, does that mean that there's anything bad? Th think about that with me for a second. If God causes all things to work together for good, does that mean that there's anything bad? Duh, yeah, I'll read Romans 8, 18 through 27. Romans 8, 18 through 27 is all about the groanings of the present age. The present age is under captivity of the evil one. And the present age is under the groanings and sufferings of the present age. If you look at Romans 8, 28, and what's really going on in that passage, it's this. That word in, in our English translation, God calls us all things to work together, is in Greek the word synergos, which is where we get our English word synergy. God synergizes all things together for good. And it seems to me in Romans 8, 28, the things he's talking about, the all things, he synergizes the groanings of the spirit with the groanings of the saints, with the groanings of the creation. And God synergizes the groanings of the spirit, the groanings of the saints, and the groanings of creation together. And somehow in his divine, miraculous work, causes all those things to work together for good. Oh, gracious, yes. This present age is filled with groaning and suffering and loss and hardship. This age is filled with a lot of bad things. But we who follow the crucified and risen Lord know God can cause a resurrection to come out of even the most horrid of this. God can cause life to come even in the darkest of places. God can cause blessing to come, even the most accursed of objects. Our job as Christians is not to pat each other on the back and say, it's okay, sister, just pray and it'll be all right. Our job is to groan. It's God's job to make it into something good. We're not the ones who are going to turn the groanings of the present age into something good. God is. But what we need to rest in assurance is, is that God is with us through these times. We must not be people who pray merely for rescue. Oh, yes, the Psalms are filled with rescue. But in every single one of the Psalms of lament and trial, it always regresses upon the same point. God, you will be with us. 
God, do not leave me and I will never leave you. So let me take this back. I make it quite personal for myself. We just found out my mom has breast cancer. What does that mean for how I pray? What does that mean for how I talk to her? What does that mean for other Christians as they try to comfort us and my family? Rescue's easy. I would also suggest rescue is work. People of faith in Jesus Christ trust in the redemptive work of God. God did not leave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but they still had to go through the fire. God did not leave Israel, but they still had to go through the waters. And God has not left us in either of us, but we must pass through the waters. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O King. But if not, be it known to you, O King, that we will not worship your gods or serve the golden image that you have set up. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come to you through our high priest, Jesus Christ. And we know that Jesus is able to sympathize with us for he knows the weaknesses and the sicknesses of this present. And Father, we thank you for your compassion that has reached down to us and for your grace that brings us back to you. <clears throat> Father, I do not know what each person here is experiencing. And I do not know the trial that each family is passing through at this time. But Father, you know the fires and you know the waters of this present age. I pray that you be with us. And I pray that we be with you. I pray that you strengthen our faith. You strengthen our patience. You strengthen our love and our mercy and our grace. Father, in the darkness, may your light shine through. In the cold, may your warmth come in. In times of suffering, may your love overwhelm us. To you be the glory. To you alone we turn for help. Through Jesus Christ in the Spirit we pray. There's five very important things that are required for salvation. Our God is created. Out of his love and his goodness, our God created. And yet we rebelled against him. And even when we rebelled, our God did not leave us alone, but the Father has provided. The son has sacrificed and the spirit regenerates. And because God has raised the dry bones that we weren't able, and because God has done what was impossible for us, we can respond to his invitation. Hearing the good news that I have proclaimed to you, believing in Jesus as the Christ, repenting from unrighteousness to righteousness, confessing our faith to Jesus Christ, and being immersed in water from death into newness of life. If anyone needs to respond to the Lord's call this evening, I should come forward as we stand and as we sing. Jesus, come.